This is really a tour of the geology of southwest United States. And we're going to start from the west, starting over Morro Bay, Big Sur, and we'll work our way over to Arizona. Southern California, Southern Utah, and Arizona. So these are all places that you can come, go visit. All of them are within a day drive. We have our field classes, which are offered uh, every semester. <coughs> and so we go up to Big Sur. And by the way, this is the from Ragged Point. That's the fastest rising mountain range in the world. Mm -hmm. It's rising faster <coughs> than the Himalayas. Okay, and we also visit other places on our field trips, like this is Salt Flats <coughs> and Carrizo Plain. Has anybody here been to Carrizo Plain? No. It's, a, it's an underappreciated and brand new national monument. It has like a lowly little visitor center open three months out, San Andreas Fault. And what it's happening here is we're looking straight down the fall, where all those bushes are, is the San Andreas Fault. You can actually stand, we have lunch, and people have lunch, and they could have like one foot in North America, like one foot on the Pacific, like, and that was sort of fun. This, this is getting down and looking for minerals, okay? And what we're looking for, we're on Moonstone Beach, but we're not looking for moonstones, because that's totally picked over. Doesn't it? We're, we're looking for here is jade, and you can get little jade pebbles. And so everybody, all these people on their belly here um, at sunset. Okay. So our first student here is on Nicanor Batista. He's one of our newer geology majors. And he is um, going to spend just a few minutes talking about this amazing place called Morro Rock. Um, what my presentation will be um, on how Morro Rock was formed. Morro Rock is located in Morro Bay, um, near San Luis Obispo about uh, three hours northwest from here. During the fall of 2011, the Geology 34 lab had a trip to visit Moore Bay. And um, how many have you been to Moore Bay? Raise your hand. So uh, you guys like it over there? Yeah. Like ours. I was to time, about 15 million years ago, there was some eccentric fall start to the California Park. You can see here. Um, at the same time, there are some extensions that was um, caused by normal falls. Some magma flow in the <coughs> cracks and start to form a volcano chain. There are 12 volcanoes in the chain that goes from San Luis Obispo over there to Moro Bay. Moro Rock was forming a volcano as a volcano neck. Um, see what the volcano neck? Um, a volcanic neck is a hard rock in the band that did not erode when the rest of the volcanic eroded. This one particular one, we went out to um, the National Association of Geoscience Teacher Conference. In fact, we sponsored something. We went up to the Kelso Dunes. Has anybody been to the Kelso Dunes? Oh my gosh, they are the best. And they're like three hours away from here. And they are the tallest engines in California. And there are a lot of fun. When you go to Kelso Dunes, you have the choice of crawling up here, uh, crawling, right? walking up to the top. And this is like hundreds of feet high. And then what do you do when you're on top of a dune? Pull that jump off. Jump. You jump. <laughs> so we have lessons in jumping. Okay, so this is Skip, who you'll see tonight. And so um, but this is just a proof that geology can be fun. So, oh no, this is the Kama Fu way of jumping or something like that. Um, one thing I've got to mention, though, these dunes, you shouldn't just jump off. Because I, uh, if you walk down them, you hear the growl. They're called growling dunes or barking dunes, and uh, only certain dunes do that. Um, there's some in Hawaii and there's the Kelso dunes. And it's only if those sand grains are really, really round. They've been through the mill like two or three times. Okay, and then this is June. Um, teaching me a new way of jumping. <laughs> I, I don't know. So, okay, we have lots of cinder cones. We got them um, in south of Baker on the Hill Baker Road. There's a whole bunch of volcanoes. And to tell us about some of this is Skip. Afternoon, folks. How are we doing today? Thank you. Hey. 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 Rocks, right? <laughs> so, I'm here to present cinder cones uh, by uh, me. <laughs> Four marvelous fun facts about cinder cones is that one, they develop rapidly. Nice little fun fact for you: there was a 
little crack in Mexico in, uh, I think, 1949. In nine years, it developed into a 1,000-foot center cone. So it developed really rapidly in comparison to uh, shield or combustible volcanoes. When gas forces steaming lava upwards into the air, as it cools, when it falls to the ground, it's usually, it converts into pebbles, or cinders, as scientists call them. These build up around the vent, they ejected them, forming a cone, and giving this type of volcano its name. We, we see uh, lava tubes formed by cinder cone volcanoes. <laughs> Some lava tubes, you can come out and be reborn again, as you can see. <laughs> Globs that are airborne and are 2.5 <coughs> inches in diameter or bigger are called bombs. And here we can see bigger bombs here. I just have a football that comes to mind. The tail usually comes attached. When it goes up in the air, it leaves a trail. And when it comes down, it breaks off like a tadpole. It usually goes like that when it comes down. OK, next we want Angela to come up. And um, she's one of our newer geology majors, too. I am just going to give you a brief um, run through about what we did when we went to Anza Borrego. Um, we went to the Salton Sea, was one of our stops. And like, oh, we went to uh, Shell Reef and got to see fossils, which are, by the way, up here, if you'd like to see if there's a big chunk somewhere. That. that. Um, with all kinds of crazy fossil oysters. The most incredible thing by far for me was. Uh, getting to see the wind cave, and I was even more amazed by how the process works. What happens to form these is sand gets blown off of the badlands and gets thrown onto the front sur the surface of these sandstone structures, and slowly get, or gets trapped inside of the cracks that are exposed and gets spun around for years and years and carves these gorgeous alcoves and outcroppings and everything new that you see was caused by the wind just doing what it does best and blowing stuff around. Okay, so the next talk we have is about the mud volcanoes, which are nearby there. Um, they're just beyond Ensbrego, but it's much easier for us to get there. Even the West Railway almost the whole way, um, if you know how to get to Salt and Sea. Tell me, to present this is one of our newer geology majors is Sammy Um Last month, um, Geology 32 Lab took a trip to Enzo Borrego, and one of the stops was um, the Mud Volcano. Um, mud Volcano were formed when hot water and mud are mixed in the earth, and as you can see, um, this magma chamber here um, heats up, and heats up the water um, reservoir, and it, it um, it turns into a gas or a steam, and then it pushes up to the mud pool, which causes um, bubbles. These bubbles, um, they're caused by methane, and um, this methane is really smelly, um, so when you go visit them, it's really stinky. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the difference between um, a mud volcano and a regular volcano is um, uh, the, mag the magma doesn't really rise, it's basically just um, a bunch of gases and water um, trying to escape. As you can see here, um, the methane is trying to escape, so it um, like pops up and just spreads everywhere. And as it dries, um, it's sort of like if you feel right here on the side, it's very clay-like and still stoneish. And um, something fun I got to do was um, dip my hand into uh, a mud volcano um, liquid. And it was really hot, um, but most of them came up to 100 degrees. So that was pretty cool. uh, We went on a big, huge science club trip. It was, um, as I already explained, it's mostly earth science students. And they're a very active club, one of the largest clubs on the campus. And thanks to the generosity of the South Bay the Area Mineral Society, they had a fundraiser at the mineral show last month and raised about 200 bucks, and a lot of you were generous in your donations. Okay, Bryce Cannon was one of our high points. In fact, they voted at their number one spot. How many people have been to Bryce Cannon? All right, see, almost everybody. I knew it. Um, and it's an awesome place. He's a, even our vice president of our college showed up. Um, all right, next on our thing here, and we went over to Zion. What's everybody doing? Hey. Awesome. Uh, as uh, Joe is nice enough to point out, my name is Ian Walker. 
Uh, I'm a geology major at uh, El Camino. Uh, I am an officer in this science club. And uh, the science club went to Zion on April 9th and 10th of, of this year. <coughs> Excuse me, of this year. Um, has anybody been to Zion? If you were there, you probably noticed the uh, cross bedding, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Yeah, that's the cross bedding there. It's called cross bedding because it cuts across the normal horizontal uh, bedding or layers. Um, the formation is basically from windblown uh, sediments and sand of varying colors, types, and uh, compositions, different minerals. They accumulate in thin layers um, and they build over time. Uh, what happens is it eventually will reach the angle of repose, which is the maximum angle that sand can hold itself up. And what will happen is a big avalanche will occur and the sand will travel down the back side. Um, it's about 30 degrees, the angle of repose. Um, and what happens then after the sand dunes are formed, uh, calcium bearing solutions end up seeping into the sand and it cements it together creating the Navajo sandstone, which has a very red color, which is indicative of formation in a dry environment where the uh, iron has, in the sediments has been able to oxidize over time. Using these tools, we can determine uh, the direction of the sediment transport as well as the way the winds were going. Um, from this information, geologists have been able to determine that about 200 million years ago, the southwestern United States was covered in a, a large desert, um, including parts of the Grand Canyon. Who's been to the Grand Canyon? Awesome. There is a little bit of cross bedding uh, in the fossilized dune formations in the upper wall of the Grand Canyon. It's actually the second layer down, so look out for that. It's called the Coca Neal Formation. Um, there it is, the second layer down. Um, it's uh, a great tool for geologists to determine the geologic history of an area, to be able to put the puzzle together, basically, and to tell what happened in the past. It's also something really cool to look at, so get out there if you have a chance. The Grand Canyon, and uh, we were, there was some day, we were going to the school newspaper, okay? To help tell, talk to about us, the Grand Canyon, to tell us about Grand Canyon is another brand new geology major. This is Jerry Hernandez. <laughs> So today I won't be talking about the layer uh, deposit of the Grand Canyon, I'll be talking about the formation of the Grand Canyon. And uh, two basic, two of the main concepts that go with the, the Grand Canyon are stream capture and headward erosion. And uh, they sort of go hand in hand in this case, and uh, you can't have one without the other. So this here is a map of the Grand Canyon. Uh, this is the Grand Canyon. Uh, this here. It's the old Colorado River, which then uh, eventually diverts into uh, which one is now the Grand Canyon. This is the present Colorado River, Little Colorado River, as you can see. Um, so let me just give you a quick definition of stream capture. Um, stream capture is a, also known as river capture. It's a geomorphological phenomenon that occurs when a river or stream diverts. See, diverts from its original bed into the neighboring stream. And how does this happen? It happens with headward erosion. Uh, so headward erosion is a river process of erosion that lengthens the stream or gully at its end. And this is the uphill end. That's where uh, and it enlarges the drainage basin. This is the drainage basin here. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit. So basically this stream here, it just started digging little, little by little until it reached the Colorado River, and then it just snatched it from its original bed. And that sort of, that concept is what interested me in giving, me, in giving this presentation today. Uh, I believe convergent uh, plate boundaries uh, cause this Kaibab Plateau, which lies on the Colorado Plateau, to uplift. So instead of the normal uh, convergent boundary for the plates to go um, under, to, under, down into the earth, it went through Earth's crust, which lifted it, causing this, this plateau to uplift. This whole Colorado River used to run down this way, but then it, when it was snatched, um, it changed its direction, of, and then Little Colorado River now falls into um, through the Grand Canyon as well. Um, how long did this take, you might ask? Just, uh, it actually took about five million years, which is very rapid in geologic time. Uh, the rate of vertical vertical erosion was about a foot every thousand years, or a thousand feet every million years. 
you're going to go to the Grand Canyon or anything around there, you've got to go that extra half hour and make it to Meteor Freighter. One of the world class things that we have in Southwest United States, we have everything here. This is the best place. This is why I moved 3,000 miles to teach geology here. We have everything. And this is, this is the farthest one away. This takes about nine hours to get to. But to tell us about this is John Virgin. I'm a geology and astronomy major. My career goal is to become an astrogeologist. I love to study other planets, so naturally this would be of great interest to me. Now, um, I know a lot of you obviously have been to Arizona. How many people here have been to Meteor Crater? Okay, so a good number of you. Uh, many people, when they go here, it's really just a big hole in the ground, but when you take a little time to learn about it and start to look at features, it's actually quite fascinating. This is the first crater on Earth that was actually recognized as being of extraterrestrial origin. Origin. Everybody before this time thought they were formed by volcanoes or steam explosions, but this is where an asteroid struck the Earth. But 50,000 years ago, a nickel-iron meteorite struck the land, and the size of the asteroid was about 150 uh, feet across. Um, but when it hit the ground, uh, it hit with nuclear force. It hit with about the, uh, the energy of 150 Hiroshima A-bombs. And what it did, uh, rather than burrow into the ground like many people would logically assume, there was so much energy involved that it literally vaporized the majority of the, uh, the meteorite. And so when you go to Meteor Crater and into that area today, you actually find very little meteorite material. Most of it uh, turned literally to vapor well, and shock waves went through the ground and it threw material out uh, for a distance of about six miles. And this is a cross section, a, a side view of the crater. Uh, the crater is about three quarters of a mile across, and this was the original hole that was gouged out by the meteorite. And that was about 800 feet deep. But when it threw the material out, it also threw a lot of material straight up into the air, and that just fell right back down into the hole, and it filled it in, actually, again, within moments, about 300 feet. But erosion over the last 50,000 years has also filled in a very thin layer, it's called alluvium, uh, here in the crater itself. So that added about another 200 feet of depth. So today it's only out of 550 feet deep. So when it exploded, and it threw out that material, it took these layers here, and it bent them upward. Now this green here, you'll see a little line right there. That's called a hinge. Uh, these layers here were actually flipped over completely backwards. Um, and uh, when you go to the crater today, it's actually kind of difficult to see. But one of the biggest proofs that this was of a meteorite or impact origin is what's called rock flower. And if you were standing there on the rim and you were to grab some of these rocks, you can pick them up in your hand and crush them literally into flour. And that's because it was pummeled by the, um, by the energy of the uh, impact. Well, why is a, a place like Meteor and Crater so important to science? And so the Earth, as well as every other planet, formed through this process of accretion. We have erosion, so we only have maybe two or three hundred recognized meteor craters on Earth today, but if you look at the moon, and I'm sure most of you have seen it through a telescope, maybe at Griffith Park, uh, it's covered in craters. And so when we study this, it's a key to understanding the origin and evolution of the solar system, but also our own world. So, uh, are going to He was talking about astronauts using these as landing, so that's a perfect segue to my last thing I want to conclude on. And that is our most famous geology graduate. It's an astronaut. He's really well known. His name is Michael Fink. And he, um, he remembers fondly going to Anzabarago and Death Valley with uh, me and the other teachers and stuff. And one of the things he was showing is that when he was, he spent an entire year in the space station, in two six month segments. And one of the things they get to do is bring up their own stuff. So, yeah, to where he's <laughs> <laughs> So, this is him floating around in outer